It's not a spider that is gonna uh, go and start chasing people. Uh, it's a spider that uh, it spends most of the time on a web. Uh, females are the ones that they uh, often build those, those beautiful webs. So it doesn't really pose a risk for, for people. Welcome to Extension Out Loud, a podcast from Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm Paul Treadwell. Recently, the Joro spider has gained some attention in the news. This spider is an invasive species that's been in the United States for years and has active populations in some southern states. There have been various claims made about this large, yet generally reclusive spider. Can they really fly? Do they pose a threat to humans? And how concerned should we be here in New York about their potential of arrival? To address these questions and dispel some of the myths surrounding the Joro spider, I sat down with Alejandro Calixto, director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program at Cornell University. We discussed common concerns about the Joro spider, its potential impact on human, and its effect on native species. We also explored the role of climate change in facilitating the spread of pests like the Joro spider, ticks, and spotted lanternfly. I'm Alejandro Calixto. I serve as the director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. Uh, we're part of Cornell University. Well, thanks for joining me today, Alejandro. Well, thank you for the invitation. And we're we're here today, really, because in the news we've heard a lot about this this invasive spider. That while it's not in New York State, has certainly made headlines with it being able to fly, and it's huge. And people are sort of wondering what's going to happen when it comes to New York State. If it comes to New York State, what are the concerns we have around this spider? Is it really dangerous? Uh, it, it, it's been said it's venomous. What does that really mean? So if you could help us understand the Joro spider just a little bit. Sure, Paul. Yeah, so first of all, it's not a, it doesn't pose any threat to humans. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to start saying that every single spider uh, has venom. Mm -hmm. So from the small spiders that you see in your kitchen to the Joro spiders to tarantulas, they have uh, venom glands. Mm -hmm. So, and they use the venom to secure and paralyze the prey and as a defense. So Joro spiders, they do have a, a venom, but that venom is proportional to the prey they're trying to capture. So it won't, po it won't pose a risk to humans. It's not a spider that is gonna uh, go and start chasing people. Uh, it's a spider that uh, it spends most of the time on a web. Uh, females are the ones that they uh, often build those, those beautiful webs. So it doesn't really pose a, a risk for, for people right now. And just as I was getting ready to, to talk to you, I read a uh, quick thing that said they're kind of bashful. They don't really seek out human interaction. Is that true? That is correct. So, I mean, it's a, the, their interest is find a space where they can build a web and capture different types of insects. So uh, they like those quiet areas uh, where they can find a lot of flying insects in particular. So yeah, they don't interact with people. I mean, there's not a, it's not a spider that you're going to see walking in the sidewalk uh -huh. or, or stuff like that. It's just a spider that spends most of the time uh, on a web. Okay. And how did they end up in the United States? That's a very good question. So uh, it was introduced uh, in the U.S. Uh, in 2013, probably a shipment coming from Asia. Their native range goes all the way from India to Japan. Okay. So if you look at the map, it has the conditions in terms of temp climate conditions are similar. Uh, it got in, in Georgia at some point, it got established, there's populations established in Georgia and it has moved into another states, but it's not, it doesn't disperse as uh, insects, some insects like spotted lanternflies. So it, it's really slow. So uh, it will take a lot of time to, to move to another states, uh, including uh, New York. So we might not see any, any of these spiders for the next five or seven years. That, that is hard to say. I mean, there might be some accidental introductions, but to see a population the size that we've seen in Georgia, in mm -hmm. South Carolina, it will take many years to, to really see the presence of that spider. Uh, so yeah, it might take a few years before we can see a spider like that here it, in New York. It does bring up the question though, when, when a new species moves in, so when they're moving into Georgia or the next state up, they're not entering a, a vacuum. They're, they're moving into territory that's already occupied. So is there, are there damages that just the simple 
expansion of the, the range of this spider can have on some of our native population or some of the population that's been nativized? Yeah, that's uh, another really good question, Paul. Uh, so yeah, invasive species, they have to go through, there is biotic and abiotic factors mm -hmm. that uh, basically determines the success or not, or unsuccessful establishment uh, of an invasive species. In this particular case, there were some uh, environmental factors that allow a spider to establish. Those include uh, the habitat, uh, the uh, prey avail availability in that area. So in theory, it's probably using uh, the space and uh, and other resources that native species are being using. So right now it's really, it, it, there's a, a group of people working in Georgia and South Carolina, looking at the environmental impact of these spiders. So in theory, it might have uh, a negative impact. It might impact some native uh, uh, spiders uh, in, in, in the Southeast in particular. There is uh, a similar spider that is native, uh, which is the golden silk or orb weaver. Uh, which it has constructs the same web, uses the similar habitat, and that's the one that we suspect it might have uh, some impact in those mm -hmm. native populations. So I think, you know, just in listening to you talk, Alejandro, I think one of the messages is, well, there are a couple messages. One is don't panic if you see a spider. The second thing is it could be a native spider that looks similar to the invasive spider. So your first action probably shouldn't be to kill it. Uh, but if you have a suspicion, if you, if you have uncertainties about the, the spider that you're seeing or the insect that you're seeing, what should someone do? Yeah. So yeah, first of all, the, the first thing that people should do is, uh, confirm that is a Jory spider or not. Uh, we don't like people to go and start killing spiders without knowing what, what they are because they play an, a very important role in nature. So if they find, uh, something that they suspect is a Jory spider, uh, a picture mm -hmm. uh, would be good for us to see if uh, it resembles a Jura spider. They can send it to our uh, email, uh, nysipm at cornell.edu. Okay. And, and then if we suspect that it's a Jura spider, we might need to get an actual a specimen just to confirm that. Uh, we have received many pictures from many people because this has been uh, on the media. So we've been getting a lot of calls. Uh, people saying that spiders are part of shooting, which they're not. But, uh, so once we confirm that it's not, uh, people, they get that information and, and we basically tell people just leave the spider alone. It's, it's actually a, a friend, uh, of nature and, 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 and to them as well. So you mentioned parachuting. I just want to loop back to the, to the whole concept of, you know, I've seen the headline about the flying spiders. So what can you tell me about drawer spiders and their ability to fly or not fly? Right. So. All these spiders, they, uh, as they produce venom, they have uh, uh, venom glands. They also have cell glands. So every single spider, they, they have the ability to produce cell. So the cell is used for building a web uh, or making the egg, uh, egg sac, et mm -hmm. cetera, et cetera. There is a particular type of cell that is being used by some uh, species to move from one place to another. So it's like a thread. They throw it on the air and then it gets attached to a structure like a tree. Uh -huh. And then they basically, they zip line. That's, okay. that's how they move from one place to another, but they're not, they don't have parachutes. They're not gonna, we're not gonna see spiders uh, falling from the sky as the <laughs> uh, media has, has, has claimed recently. Uh, people might see not only your spiders, but any other spider just doing uh, the uh, ballooning. That's the technical word for that. It's just the way a spider's dispersed Typically in the spring okay. uh, is when we see that, but also in the fall. Okay. Just when they start getting ready for, uh, for overwintering. Okay. So, so not, not going to be flying in through our windows and, <laughs> and attacking our pets or anything like that. No, not, not at all. So <clears throat> the other, the other question about these spiders and the world we're living in now is, is there any impact that, that the shifting climate that we're experiencing, is that helping in the dispersal of these sorts of things. How does that impact Joro spiders or any other invasive that we might see here in, in New York state? And we'll, if you could talk about the spider first, then we'll get to some of the New York state things that we're experiencing now. Sure. 
Yeah, so temperature is a very important factor for uh, insect and spider development. Mm -hmm. So if you start increasing those temperatures, uh, you might allow some species to uh, reproduce faster, uh, probably lay more eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if they have more than one generation per year, they can add an extra generation. So yeah, climate has a significant impact on, on particularly on insects and spiders. Now that uh, attached to climate change, it might not sound really important, but if you look at a, a pest mm -hmm. that in the past used to have uh, three generations per year, now we're seeing some pests that they have up to four and five generations per year because we have warmer falls and now a mild winter and also the spring is warming up uh, much earlier. So that really poses a problem. If it's a pest that has uh, impact on a commodity, then uh, if you don't have the tools, you might need to use a pesticide, right? Uh, so you're adding uh, another, uh, an, an extra pesticide application. Uh, of course, that moves uh, equipment. You're increasing uh, production of uh, mon uh, carbon monoxide. And, and also you can create resistance because you're adding more sprays mm -hmm. to the same pest through that season. So it is it is very complicated uh, for invasive species. It's, it's actually a, a very important factor for establishment and spread. So temperature not only reg regulates uh, things that they, they use for feeding, other insects or other spiders or plants, uh, but also helps with the development. Mm -hmm. So it, they might uh, ramp up, uh, uh, make their, their development much faster and become more, become more efficient at using the resources that other native species use in natural and even agricultural systems. Great. So I, I want to be mindful of the time here, but before we wrap this up, since we've, we've set Jural spiders aside, they're not a threat, they're not going to fly through our windows. What are some, what are some issues that, that are happening here in New York State that, that are indicating people should maybe give a little attention to things, maybe let me try to rephrase that in a way that makes more sense. Are there, are there insects that are coming into the state now that we should be concerned about that we didn't have five years ago? Uh, well, yeah, of course, the spotted antlerfly is one of them. And uh, maybe one of the reasons that we've seen that uh, quick spread and establishment is, is those, uh, the climate change. Mm -hmm. So particularly during the winter, last winter, it was a mild winter. We noticed said that the oviposition of a spotted lanternfly was extended, mm -hmm. which is translated into more eggs that are going to hatch out or they already hatch out in the spring. So we're starting to see pre high pressure in some areas that we were probably not expecting in these years. So spotted lanternfly is one example, not an insect, but a related uh, organism, ticks. So ticks, uh, as you many have experienced that this past winter, we had days uh, in December, January that it got really warm and we see ticks very active. Mm -hmm. So temperature regulates the activity of these organisms. So we're going to see a lot of activity, which is being translated. They're going to be attaching to uh, an animals, including humans, and they're being dispersed more efficiently. And that is translated into increasing in the numbers across the state. So we really have to be more vigilant with, you know, takes in particular, that's uh, an issue for us. Mosquitoes, of course. Uh, and of course, there's different uh, pests that impact uh, agricultural systems that mm -hmm. in the past were possibly uh, an issue, but now their, uh, their uh, impact is probably being increased due to uh, you know, climate change yeah. and changes in temperature and humidity and other factors. Fish. There's just one, one thing you said, ticks are not insects. What are ticks? So ticks are under, uh, they're arthropods. So, so they're under the same kind of group as insects. They are arachnids. Okay. So ticks are closely related to spiders. Okay. And so they have two body parts and uh, four, four, uh, eight, eight legs or oh, four pairs of legs. And uh, their mouth parts, uh, they're called chelicera. So either a tick or a spider, they have very similar uh, mouth bars. So versus insects, they have three body pores and they have uh, three pairs of legs or six legs. Awesome. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. So spiders are really problematic then. <laughs> no, 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 so we don't want to cast not all spiders. Subspecies that are ticks are, are, are problematic. Yeah. But 
Alejandro, thank you very much for taking your time. No, thank we, you, Paul, uh, for the invitation. We'll certainly include links to New York State IPM yeah. so that people can find sure. further resources. Thank you for listening to this episode. For more information about this episode, including show notes and a transcript, visit extensionoutloud.com. And be sure to subscribe to Extension Out Loud on your favorite podcast directory.